welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kath Vincent. On the show, a personal and uplifting movie by writer-director Casey Stetson. Pushing the boundaries with Idol's global TV producer, Gavin Wood. And director Graham Southwell on how givers gain through networking. Love. And in the Wild Records music slot with Jesse Wilde, we hear original music from singer-songwriter Jacob O'Callaghan. All this and more to wake up your wow. Casey, welcome. I'm so happy you're Thank here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So you have years and years of experience as a director, as a writer, mm -hmm. as an acting coach. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about that. Uh, well, I started when I was 15. Oh. I was, yeah, I started acting when I was 15, and I was in a Noel Coward play, and you know, and it just went. I went to Boston University for college, and I went to the Royal Academy in London, and. Um, I found I was acting for years, but I found it to be um, challenging because at that uh, time, it the the parameters of casting for women were really narrow. Right. So if you were in any way different, you weren't going to get a, a lot of jobs. Right. Um, and I was a punk rocker. You know, I was a real rebel. And so, and also, I wanted to have more. Um, dominion over my creativity instead of waiting around for a job all the time, which right. unfortunately okay. actors have to do quite a bit. Yeah. So that sounds like a director in the making. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I started directing. I started as a fight director. I was the first female uh, fight choreographer in the United States. Oh. So like when you see a Shakespeare play and all the sword fights, that I was the person who would choreograph that and train the actors. And I did that for many years. How cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah. It was really, really fun. And it taught me a lot about um, how to work with actors, yeah. how to get the most out of them, obviously. And also, it taught me a lot about conflict, you know? And if, if you um, think about drama and comedy, is this all based on conflict? And so I learned a lot about fighting to win the scene, right? And that helped me as a director because I got, you know, uh, being a stage combat choreographer is, is interesting, but it's not going to be really fulfilling for your whole life. Right. So I segged into directing. Right. Okay. And so for many, many years, I was a professional theater director in the States and regional theater and, and, and you know, smaller houses. And, and then I got to the point where I was like, well, you know, you do all this work and you can do the best play anybody's ever seen. But when the play closes, it's gone. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's just like in a puff of smoke, and all you have is some reviews, you know? Or yeah, and some... I, I guess it's like it never happened. Yeah, you know? exactly. You, you can't play the tape again. Right. I mean, it's nice to have memories, but, you know, that's it. And so I started getting really interested in film. Cool. And you're working on this very specific project right now. Yes. Tell us about it. Um, it's called Upside Down, and it's a short film. And it's a uh, women-driven story. And it's about a single mom who's struggling to raise her um, nine-year-old Down syndrome boy right. on her own. So that was a pretty hard-hitting yeah. movie. Yeah. And so you've written it? Yes, I, I've written it. Um, my wife and I, it's a family project, so my wife and I have written it together. Yeah. And I'll be directing it, and she'll be playing the lead. And our son, Stetson, who has Down syndrome, will be playing himself. Wow, so that's really close to home. Yeah, it's really close to home. How, how has it been working on something that is really, you know, must in a way be very vulnerable? Well, you know, as a writer, we're taught to write from our truth. Yeah. Um, I've been writing a lot of genre, and so this is really good for me to, to keep it really simple and tell a personal story. And so what are the themes for you personally that have come out through the movie? Uh, well, first of all, compassion. Yeah. And so many things that happen with single moms happen challenging things happen invisibly. They happen inside the home. And I think like when other mothers see us bring our special children to school, they don't really have a chance, because how could they, yeah. to consider what our, our unique challenges are. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, we're hoping that people will watch the movie and um, open up a little bit around special kids. And what is the style of the movie? I mean, is it kind of quite, I imagine it might be quite sad in places. Is it quite uplifting. It, it, it is in the end. <laughs> we, we definitely are trying to be unflinching when it comes to looking at the, the challenges. Yeah. And so listen, you're crowdfunding this, aren't you? Yeah. How's that going? Great. So we were going for a $3,000 um, basic goal yeah. on Boosted, but we also have a stretch goal. So we met our $3,000 goal within a week. 
Wow. We still have a couple of weeks to go and we're all, you know, we're getting there. We need a little bit more help to get over the final um, line. Yes. Well, listen, it's not too late to donate. <laughs> so the URL is right here. You can donate to support this fabulous film. So outside of the film, though, actually, your own personal circumstances of raising a Down syndrome child, that must be incredibly challenging. It's with great light comes great shadow. <sighs> And so the, the gifts are off the chart. I would never have dreamt about how incredibly magical and wonderful it is to have a kid like this. Yeah. Uh, the, the difficult parts um, are really challenging. He was born very, very ill. And so we had to get through that. And then they develop a lot slower. So they'll get there. Yeah. It's just so much, like he didn't walk until he was almost three. Yeah. And you know, toileting and stuff like that. So they will get there. You have to have faith in them. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like it's just parenting plus plus. Yeah, yeah. There's sleep issues involved. You have to, re it really makes you kind of um, strong yeah. to have a kid like that. Yeah. And how is he finding acting in it? He loves it. Yeah. He's like stealing every scene he's in. <laughs> uh, we have all these really highly trained and professional actors in the film. Yeah. And he's just chewing them to pieces. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's have a look at Stetson, actually. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten a lot of likes. Yeah, I bet, yeah. I bet. And so you've assembled quite a team. So, mm. so local talk in this is? All local, right. all local talent, all homegrown. Okay, yeah. and, where, and where will the film air? We'll be, um, oh, it'll be in all the local festivals, and we're also going to try the international festivals, if we do a good job, mm. yeah, and we'll try there. And also, eventually, once it's run through the festivals, then we can put it online. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And what was the hardest thing about the journey so far? Oh, it's hard to say that because everybody has been so incredibly gracious and supportive. I would say it was in the writing. Yeah. Um, there's one scene in particular that's very, very emotional where um, our, our main single mom opens up and finally gets vulnerable and shares her struggles with some other women. And it was, it, we had, I had to go there to write it, you yeah. know? Yeah. About how hard it is sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So I guess if people are going to go and see this movie, they probably need to bring their tissues with them. I hope so. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that they cry and then they are happy at Brilliant. the end. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Next up, being a maverick to bring ideas to life. Gavin, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Good to be here. Now, you're normally behind the camera, aren't you? I am. I've spent a career staying on that side of the lens. <laughs> well, we brought you out front because you are a TV producer and you've worked on heaps of really cool stuff, haven't you? Mm, yeah, I've made a few um, here and internationally. And uh, the most recognisable stuff in New Zealand would be things like um, Sale of the Century and Wheel of Fortune. Sale of the Century. Did you yeah. have that here as well? You had did. it in England, obviously. Well, it was originally stolen from the uh, Australians <laughs> who stole it from the Americans. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought we invented it. <laughs> no, sorry, but no. Yeah. So, gosh, Sale of the Century, Wheel of Fortune, all of those, I mean, they've been around a while and obviously quite iconic. You yeah, know? it was strip formatted shows were big here for a long time. Yeah. So we made I think something like Sale, we made 1,065 episodes oh, for a five and a half year run. Oh my goodness. Uh, so <clears throat> and that gets a bit boring after a while because you tend to you make the same thing yeah. day in and day out. Yeah. And you know, you do five shows a day. Five shows a five shows a day? Five episodes a day, completely finished. <laughs> we we do like two. We do two a day and I think we're really rolling here. Oh, and yeah. we all go home, we're like, oh exhausted, you know, we've got to drink wine and stuff. I, I consult now, so I could come in and help you out with that. Yeah, do you know, yeah. I don't know if I want to do five a day. <laughs> <laughs> we did better when we made Wheel of Fortune when Philip Leishman was on the show. We used to make 15 shows in two days, so eight on the first and seven on the second. Blimey. And we had to carry them out of the studio. The hosts were completely stuffed. They just I bet. couldn't speak to save their lives. I bet, actually. But uh, it was the only way we could make it work in the budget. Gosh. Yeah. Well, hey, that's, that's food for thought. You've yeah. actually got me thinking now. <laughs> yeah. And listen, you've worked on Idol and things like that as well, haven't you? Yes. Um, Idol was probably the biggest entertainment show that I've been involved in. Mm. I was running Fremantle Media in Asia when I was uh, making Idol. And so we made um, uh, nine shows in eight countries. Wow. Yeah, so I was travelling a lot. And uh, it was the same problems in every, in every different city, but just different languages. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, whether it was different in different places. So culturally, it, it's just the same. It's just the idol culture, is it? Yeah, but there are, each, each culture has its own problems. Like in Thailand, you can't have anything to do with the feet. You know, so if, if your feet are pointed the wrong way, for instance, you can actually be insulting somebody. <laughs> wow, got, got me, yeah, <laughs> got me know, thinking about it now. Yeah, because, you know, your feet are always touching the dirt, and so people, you're pointing your feet towards someone, they, they feel that you're implying that 
they're, they're deserving of dirt, you know. Oh, my <laughs> word. I'm, right, I'm going to uncross my legs now, <laughs> put my right. feet firmly on the ground. How yeah. interesting. What, what other cultural things did you come across? Um, the Philippines, for instance, was a singers, just natural singers. Yeah. And a lot of the things we do in Idol with the training and, and, uh, and how we'd present things on stage, they'd go, no, no, that's not how we do things here. So yeah. they, they would want to, t to ad adapt it to them. And so you just had to be culturally sensitive to, um, to each different location. And they always made tweaks, and, and London always had a problem with me. They classified me as a maverick because they said, look, you, these, this is the format, you can't make these changes. So a maverick, you say? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was, you had to be to make it work. Yeah. You, I was You've got always... that look about you, actually. You look like a maverick. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was always out there on my own, and because Asia is you know, 12 hours away from Europe, yeah. you could never call someone and say, is it OK if I do this? You had to make a decision on the day. Yeah. So I'd just do it. Yeah. And 90% of the time it worked. And the, the crazy thing was that, you know, you weren't allowed to change any of the formats, but I'd make changes and then get told off for them. <laughs> and then six months later, <laughs> in Europe, I'd see the same thing I'd done being done there. And that's, oh, the only reason they're doing it is because you did it in Asia. There you go. That's my change. Yeah, Come man, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got told off for that. <clears throat> what, what is the saying? Um, ask permission... Ask, ask forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> yeah, I do that a lot. And I work underground as long as possible. Yeah, yeah. no one really realises what you're doing. No, that's the, that's the key to, um, to keeping things moving along. So yeah. tell me about, about the things you're working on now. Currently, I've got the, the Winter Games happening in um, Wanaka. Oh, so yes. that's a pre-Olympic event. Yeah. And it's really a two-week skiing holiday. <laughs> but we, we get up in the you morning. You are a maverick. Come yeah, on. You know, <laughs> we get up in the morning and we, um, we shoot on the mountain for four hours and then ski for the afternoon. Yeah. And then you have to go and have a debrief in a bar somewhere in Queenstown. Sounds shocking. Terrible. It's really hard thing. work. That all sounds great, except I, I don't ski. I'm just awful. So. Well, you should come down. And you, it's easy to learn. But it's not all beer and skiing, though, is it really? No, it's not. There's, there's some serious stuff. <laughs> it is. He's like, yes, it is. No, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, no so it's not really. Okay. There, there is some serious stuff, isn't there? There, there are some serious moments. And, for instance, uh, we got a call from the government to say we want to do a memorial for Park River and broadcast it to the nation. Right. And that was on a Thursday. Yeah. And the, the memorial service was the following Wednesday. And so we had to pull together all the crew and everything and, and get ourselves in there and, and, and make that. And that was you know, really serious. It was serious. It was really intense. It was taxing and it took a huge toll on the crew. Yeah. You know, we came away from that just in really feeling the pain. Yeah. Um, and so though, but those are really fulfilling as well because you really feel like you're giving something of your skills you know, and the industry's helping to you know, get that message out there to, to the nation to say, look, this is bigger than you realise. Yeah. Mm. And what is the hardest thing about TV production, do you think? I've got my own view on that, I can tell yeah. you about Yeah, well, you would, but I think that the, the toughest thing is getting the rhythm right. Yes. And the reason that I could work internationally in cultures where I didn't speak the language was that every show in every format has rhythm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether it's news or drama or documentary or a game show or an entertainment show, it's not about music, it's about how the pace of the show works. And there's highs and lows in everything. And, you know, you look at the news as constructed that they'll start off with warm and fluffy stories and then there'll be highlights and it'll take you up and down. And yeah. you want to be able to make people think and laugh and cry within whatever format you're making. Yeah. You know, that's the ideal. And so identifying the rhythm, once you crack that, you actually can make a show without speaking the language. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I think, I think you're right. I think there's rhythm in how you produce a TV show, how you run your business, mm. how you run your life. You know, it's, yeah. it, it is about identifying really how things are supposed to run. Yeah, and I, I apply that same rule to my, the staff and the people I employ. I mean, I employ a lot of uh, contractors. Yeah. And well, I like bringing together teams of people who are all you know, brilliant in their own right and have got great skill sets. But instead of doing the old thing about leading from the front and do what I say, it's a team thing and I always get everyone to contribute because a cameraman can say, look at something and say, if we just did this, or move my camera here, or change the lights there, we can improve this like that. You know? yeah. So everybody contributes. And I listen to every idea, and, and sometimes you know, there are some things you can't do, but most of the times there are things that you can do. And so crews come into the shows going, hey, we like working with you because we get to participate. We don't just turn up. Yeah. So, you know, that's, and that's just some of the rules I've always applied to, you know, both here and, and uh, locally and internationally. That seems to work.
So what would your top tip be for business or life from everything you've learned here, <laughs> abroad, in everything you've ever worked on? Listen to your people and that the best ideas can come from the strangest places. Oh, I like that. The mm. best ideas can come from mm. the strangest places. Mm. Gavin, thanks for joining us. It's been fun, thanks. Next up, focus on others, not yourself. Graham, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Now, you head up Business Networking International here in New Zealand. Tell me a bit about that organisation. OK, so it's an international um, franchise. It started um, 32 years ago in California, and I brought it here to New Zealand 18 years ago. Wow. And, and where did you bring it from? So I was a member in London, yeah. and I um, emigrated to New Zealand and bought the franchise. Cool. The rest is history. And, you know, what were you doing then? What, what made you think you'd like to do that? Well, my... My previous career was I was a property valuer, and I've been doing it for 15 years, and I really didn't like it very much. <laughs> and so um, yeah. it was just a great opportunity. Yeah. Do you know so many people, they're doing one thing, and they just don't want to do it anymore? And what, what would your advice be to someone who thinks, you know, I'd just like to change direction? It's always a huge step out of your comfort zone, but if you're really, truly not happy, I think for me, I looked around the office and thought, I don't want to be doing this in 15 years' time, or even two years time. Yeah, or so, even next week. Exactly. <laughs> so then it becomes a whole lot easier. Yeah. But follow your heart, really. Yeah. So you moved over to New Zealand. How hard was it getting started? It was pretty hard. I um, made the mistake of trying to start B&I in January. I didn't realise that January was, it was my first January in New Zealand. I couldn't get business cards dead. Oh, no. um, By the way, if you're watching this overseas, New Zealand shuts down for the whole of December and January. Just, there's no point working. It's taken me three years to figure that out, you know. Um, but after that, it was, I was off and off I went. And, you know, when you're starting from scratch, I set up an office in my bedroom and off I went. So you set up BNI here as a, as a networking business. Yes. Tell us a bit about the format and how that works. OK, so basically we assemble groups of people, business people, uh, one person per trade or profession. They meet once a week over breakfast. And the whole focus is on helping one another, finding business for one another. And we're predicated on, on a philosophy of giving. We call it giver's gain. Right, OK. And so the same people meet every week. Yes, they do. It's not like you turn up to an event one time. No, so you join and... Um, you, it takes time to develop those um, networks and trust because when you give it a referral to someone, you're putting your reputation on the line. Yeah. So people aren't just going to do it just because they're part of a networking group that you've joined. Yeah, you actually have to know people. To earn the trust and yeah. confidence. Well, they say, don't they, that people buy from people they know, like and trust. Exactly. OK. Yeah. So week in, week out, people turn up to the same networking yep. event. They get to know and trust each other. And then you talked about referrals. Yes, so basically most people are always, always listening for opportunities for themselves. When you're part of a BNI group, there's a slight shift in your mindset and you're listening out for opportunities for other people. Yeah. And why do you think that's important? I think it's really important to be coming from that place of helping one another and um, it filters out into the community and I think it just works on so many different levels. So tell us a bit about the philosophy of BNI. Well, I could sum that up in two words, which is give us gain. And basically, you get what you want by giving to other people. And that's really how BNI works. Right. So it's a very supportive environment. You're not just in business for yourself. You're looking out for other people. That... Exactly right. Right. OK. Exactly. And, and then how does that filter through the rest of the organisation? So back in 2005, I decided that any organisation that's predicated on a philosophy of giving yeah. needs to be walking its talk. Totally. And so I looked for a charity, and the reason I chose um, hospice, which is um, our, our chosen charity, is because I'd seen what happens in a group when a member or one of their loved ones gets sick, and the way that that whole group will rally around and support that person. And I just realised that that's what hospice is doing in our community. They're there, and flying beneath the radar until you need them, and then their service is completely free. And, and the support that they offer is just tremendous. Yeah, it's a helping hand. Yeah. It really is, yeah. And so how does, how does the alliance between B&I and Hospice work? What's, what's actually manifesting? So we are, um, Hospice New Zealand's one of their national partners. We fund the palliative care scholarship program. So basically what that means is Sue and myself give Hospice New Zealand every year a chunk of money. Yeah, and great. And then they, anybody, <laughs> <laughs> anybody that's working in hospice that wants to upskill um, can apply to Hospice New Zealand for a scholarship and they, they administer that. Yeah. So we do that. Um, I also volunteer myself as, um, at a hospice. I'm a, 
a registered psychotherapist, so I volunteer oh, yeah. one of my days there, I am. And then what's really nice is that has filtered down to the whole organisation and so many of the groups um, are putting on fundraisers all around the country to raise money for their local hospices. So we've raised over $2 million now. So it's, yeah, it's working really well. That's fantastic. How many BNIs are there under your control? We, in New Zealand, we have 113 chapters now. Oh, the last that's count, a lot. Yeah. 2,600 members. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and what skills do you think that you need to lead an organisation like that? Well, whenever you get groups of people meeting together, yeah. it's inevitable that you get conflict. Yeah. And the first things I learned was that there's always two sides to every story, if not three. Yeah. And or just, twelve. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just to be there, listen, and come from a place of how can I help, yeah. um, rather than telling people what to do. Yeah. And actually, you know, New Zealand in particular is a nation of small businesses. So, you know, there's a lot of networking that goes on. What tips would you have for someone about making networking worthwhile? Well, I think networking is so important. I mean, it's obviously it's great for business, but I mean, studies have shown that people who are well networked and well connected live happier, healthier lives. Interesting. Um, it's better for our mental health so, and, and it's better for our communities because that, as I said before, it spreads out into the communities and we all start working together. Yeah. So really, if you're in business on your own, don't be alone, join a network. Exactly. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us, Graham. Thank you very much. Next up, the Wild Records music slot with Jesse Wilde. Jesse, welcome back. Great to be here. How are you getting on? How's things? How's the studio? The studio's been really busy yeah. lately. Um, we're also making a record, me and uh, Ed Taylor. Of course, we had Ed on the show The Wild with you. Taylor album Ooh. is being made and um, lots of great musicians helping us with that. Actually, that must be really cool that you can just record your own stuff. Like, never mind everyone else's, you just go, right, just get in the studio and do my own recording. Well, it's kind of cool. We've got a lot of other projects on, so sometimes I have to sneak myself in. Yeah. <laughs> we do it. We manage to do it. And who's recording in the studio right now? Right now we have Jacob O. Callahan. Oh, Callahan, that sounds like a good Irish name. It is. Um, he's, he's a great uh, New Zealand singer-songwriter from Kaikoura. Ooh, interesting. Where is Wales? With the whale watching us, absolutely. Interesting. Well, let's hear from Jacob. Let's do it.
just know that I will keep you close So I'll say goodbye now Maybe one day I'll see you again Welcome. Thank you. Mm. Great stuff, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful song. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you must thank be you. really proud of that. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I wrote it not too long ago. It's, yeah, you do get proud of things that you write, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So what influenced that song? Um, well, it's, it's quite a funny one. I never really had an experience like it before, but um, me and my friends, well, there's a couple of us, we went out. We like to go out um, just to be... You know, so sure and have a good as time. We do. went out, yeah, as you do. <laughs> as Jesse we went, does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we went out one night and we ended up talking, just sitting at a table and talking to a group of girls. And they, they were nice people, um, just a regular, normal thing you do, I suppose. And the one that I was talking to, she was really nice. Um, and as I got to know her, she told me that her boyfriend died in a car crash and it was two years ago. Um, the anniversary was coming up. and. I suppose when someone tells you something like that, you, you do feel very honoured and privileged to hear their story in that way and that they, they can open themselves up. And I did feel really bad. Uh, they had a big connection thing with Ed Sheeran, actually. Mm. Um, when he came the last time, they made a video for him to... Um, they just wanted to meet him because they had one of his songs that was really poignant and meaningful to them. So um, she showed me the video and it was, yeah, it was really sad. So the next morning, I pretty much wrote that wow. so yeah and it yeah it was, it was it was quite special and yeah i can um, hear that in your voice as you're talking about it it's a lot happens of emotion to me too you meet someone and their story touches you so much and it's usually the next morning i, I, yeah. I think you unconsciously you process the story this happened to me recently <laughs> yeah, yeah. too i met someone with a, a similar story in fact she had lost her mother father and sister in a car accident and um, yeah, I've written a song about that too. So, yeah. It's, but yeah, it gets you, doesn't it? Oh, it does, yeah. Well, amazing songs come out of incredible pain, really, don't they? Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, like, it makes you realise, you know, you're alive. You've, you know, and I went home thinking, I could probably be a bit nicer, be a bit, be a bit kinder, all of that, because you know, you, you never know when you're gonna be gone, I suppose. So that that gives it a bit of hope, just to be, be nice to people and you know, keep them in your heart. Well, I think that's great advice for everyone. We could all be a bit nicer and a bit kinder. Yeah. And you especially. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us on oh, the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. My thanks to all my special guests, to Casey, to Gavin, to Graham, to Jacob, and, of course, our very own Jesse Wilde. And until next time, don't wait to wake up your wow. I haven't even had a drink. I'll just wait there. <clears throat> Be back in a sec. No, I'm going nowhere. <laughs>